Um, let's all take a seat. We're going to talk about wastewater next. And I also have an announcement for anyone who brought uh, displays or pamphlets or brochures. Um, if you're going to be started, starting to phase out for the day and go, um, make sure you take your pamphlets back with you because we'll probably end up recycling them and as many of us are from nonprofits and such, we know how much printing costs and we hate to recycle things that we spend money on. Um, okay, so our next session is going to focus on wastewater. We have one so far. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Um, so here we have our moderator, Topher Hamlet, um, Director of Advocacy and Policy for Save the Bay. Um, he's going to be moderating our session for wastewater. Okay. How's everyone doing in this hour? Okay. Um, all right. Um, I came over here along with my colleague Rachel Colabo from Providence, Rhode Island today. Um, I submitted my passport at the door and it was received well. So um, we are um, a little bit about Save the Bay. We've been around since 1970. We're a citizens group um, and our mission is to protect and improve Narragansett Bay and that includes its watershed. Um, we started out as an organization of actually sort of a half dozen citizens that challenged the wisdom of an oil refinery on the shores of Tiverton, Rhode Island, on Narragansett Bay, um, right next to Fall River, and grew from there. And um, we do all kinds of work in environmental education, habitat restoration, and now adaptation, as well as straight out advocacy. Um, the Narragansett Bay watershed is a spectacular place, and you might think of Narragansett Bay, you think about it all as Newport and Providence and a few other places. But more than half of our watershed, about 60% of the 1,700 square mile watershed that is the Narragansett Bay watershed is actually in Massachusetts. And um, the Blackstone River is part of that, and that goes up to Worcester, Mass. Um, it's also the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. Um, the other big part in Massachusetts is the Taunton, and the Taunton is actually the largest source of fresh water uh, to Narragansett Bay. So the Taunton matters a lot for itself and also for Narragansett Bay at large. It flows into Mount Hope Bay, um, right where Fall River is. So um, we've been working for years on different kinds of issues in um, the Taunton. Um, we are very happy to be moderating this um, part of the program today, we are now entering a period of time where um, important wastewater permits are being issued to the municipal wastewater treatment facilities in the Taunton Basin, and most most uh, notably the city of Taunton, the city of Brockton, and there's a lot of work that's gone on in the city of Fall River, but that will continue as well. So there's a plan in Somerset. What happens in the Taunton is really important. You will learn more about this shortly from David Webster of EPA. Um, but I can tell you that there are sections of the Taunton and it's the Taunton's own tributaries that actually are largely effluent. And that's true in the Blackstone too. Um, when Bill Napolitano talked about integrated water management, the Taunton River is a great, the Taunton River Basin is a great example of where that can and should happen. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce David Webster of EPA who has the, um, the honor and privilege of developing these permits for the Taunton River watershed. Um, they are not without their controversy because they involve communities maybe changing the way they do things and also spending money. And um, especially in this day and age, those are not easy issues to deal with. So um, please welcome David Webster and he'll give you a very good overview of what's happening now. Very much for having having me here and EPA representing. I'm kind of filling in for Dave Pinkham. That um, he and uh, Susan Murphy, the permit writer, have been instrumental in these, and could, uh, I'll try to do my best on all the technical backup for the reasons for limits and such. But um, that's that's where the real brain power is be behind all this. Um, and thank you all for all your efforts in on behalf of stormwater clean water, for the safe drinking water, um, it's a very important mission, and I think one that whether it's from municipalities, the regulator, business, academia, watershed groups, everyone's got a very important role to play, um, and that plays out in 
on the river and in other, and other parts of the state um, and, and country as well. So again, I'm, the, um, I'm in, involved with the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. After this, I'll call it NIPTES program, which is part of the Clean Water Act, which is the basis is that if you have a pollutant that goes out a pipe point source into a stream, a river, an estuary, a pond, you can't do that unless you have an NPDES permit uh, that tells you the circumstances, the limits, the monitoring uh, associated with that. So uh, one on, on, on my world, so we, uh, in New England, it's a regional office at EPA, and in four of the states, it's a delegated program that we oversee in, in Maine, Vermont, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, New Hampshire. Um, we issue the permits in the case of Massachusetts, issued them jointly with Mass EP under their state rate uh, authority and our federal authority. So we have um, about, and just for convenience, uh, about 730 permittees that are non stormwater and even more that are stormwater. So new. Um, talk about the, the MS4 permit. In the stormwater category, we're involved with that obviously as well as the NPS permit. Now we're going to talk about non stormwater permits, and then within that, you can break them in down to the municipal, which is basically sewage, like Brock and Tom, what we're talking about today, and also industrial. And I know some of you here from my life in power plant coming in for um, the children of the NPS permits. Um, we talk to start about uh, nutrient pollution. I, this shouldn't be any news to you, uh, but it, it's a very important source of pollutants. Um, basically, you know, the science behind it is one of the limiting factors that um, there are oversimplification, lots of factors involved, but it tends to be in freshwater systems that the limiting factor in the population in, in taking off of algae growth is phosphorus and nitrogen in, in marine waters. So that if you add that, uh, excessive amounts of that nutrient to that environment, you'll tend to get um, algae taking off. Uh, what's the problem with that? Uh, the algae growth will block out the sunlight and be um, for blocking out such habitats for eelgrass, for example. Once the algae uh, dies, it disintegrates, it soaks up oxygen, which is harmful to the fish and aquatic life. Um, it's going to have aesthetic problems on its own, which are uh, unattractive and uh, can decrease commercial and economic value. In some cases, it can produce toxins, um, the blue-green algae uh, in, in freshwater systems. It's not at all uh, alone. There, it's a major source of impairment throughout the United States, as you can see from that map. Um, within the region, we have a number of different places that we're working on. Um, problems from uh, Lake Champlain and phosphorus there, the Great Bay of Hampshire, the Long Island Sound, and TNG, excuse me, the actual daily load down there. Um, but we're going to talk now for the rest of the presentation about the um, Narragansett Bay and the, the Tonka River um, watershed. What you see on this slide is a uh, broken up by regions, the um, different regions of the Narragansett Bay uh, watershed. Um, you can see that uh, in each one of those uh, little pie charts is the source of the nitrogen uh, coming up from various parts. The red is the sewer population, so you can see in areas around Providence, Fall River, and then up um, where Brockton is and where Worcester is, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty major source there. Um, the uh, orange is un, unsewered areas that includes the, uh, the, the stormwater contribution. You can see that's pretty major too. We were talking about stormwater uh, previously. Um, all that nitrogen, you know, is if it's not assimilated, it is going to end up in the Mount Hope Bay and Narragansett Bay. So the sewer, the, so the sewage. Um, well, stormwater is an important source. Sewage in this particular watershed is uh, a very important source of the pollution, the nitrogen pollution as well. Um, so where are we at, um, region wide in putting uh, in permitting for nutrients in our water in, in the NIPTES permits? In the NIPTES permits, of course, it's not just nutrients, it's um, biological uh, oxygen demand, it's, it's pH, it's metals, um, you know, it's power plants, it's heat. Um, but Again, we're talking about nutrients right now. On phosphorus permits, you can see here from recent permits in Massachusetts and New Hampshire have been down in the 0.1 to 0.2 range in milligrams per liter um, of phosphorus. In, in nitrogen, um, it ranges, and for reasons that I can explain more, each one is, is derived in a site-specific situation uh, between three, eight, or more. Um, the bait, where we come up with the numbers is 
um, several different factors. The main factors are what's called a technology base, that if there's a given technology like secondary treatment for a sewage plant, that's what has to be in. We look at that technology based standard. Um, and then we also look at a water quality based standard. For the water quality based standards, we look at there's a reasonable potential to violate a water quality standard based on that pollutant. And if there is, then we have to set a limit based on the best information we come up with on what would not violate a water quality standard with that pollutant. So, um, and then we take the more stringent of the two. If there's, if there's a technology based limit and uh, reason in a water quality based limit. So that's why you're going to get various, depending on the situation, the amount of pollution, uh, the factors, the effects in the particular environment, you may get a range of different concentrations even if they're using the same basis. Okay? When I get into the examples, particularly blocked, and I can talk a little bit more about the derivation of the, uh, the phosphorus limit and as well as the nitrogen limits. So um, how we've been doing, this is um, the, the two bars on each one of these graphs represents the year 2004 to 2013, so roughly over the last decade and what's been happening. And you can see there's been a lot of uh, permits that have gone into effect with lowering um, nitrogen levels. And in some cases, even without a permit, going into effect, communities have been proactive in reducing the amount of nitrogen in the discharge from the sewage treatment plant. You can see the first two are the sewage treatment plants around Brockton, which have had significant reductions, one stock at North Island. Um, the upper Blackstone, um, which we um, issued a uh, permit restricting nitrogen a few years ago and um, went through the court system um, and is now moving into effect, um, has had reductions. Uh, Fall River is increasing. Brockton uh, has done significant changes and upgraded their plant. Um, and Taunton has not made uh, significant progress in that, that, in that time period. Yeah. So one bit of background, the, the first two plants they showed are the, are the ones in Providence, basically serving the greater Providence area, the ones on the left. Um, in 2003, in Narragansett Bay, we had a fish kill event, which was a real shocker of an event. And um, Save the Bay and some other groups actually went to the General Assembly in Rhode Island and had sort of a special committee um, look at the causes for that fish kill and what remedies should be taken or what actions should be taken. And to our astonishment, we actually got a team of scientists together from um, the universities and the agencies, and to our, we were very happy about that. We were stunned. They, the General Assembly itself set, passed a law, a law that set a goal of reducing nitrogen inputs from Upper Narragansett Bay, the urban treatment plants, by 50% in 10 years. And so that was 2004 to last year. Um, they have, the plants, um, in the Providence area, plus the Blackstone plants, have actually achieved more like a 60% reduction in nitrogen loadings, which is a pretty amazing thing. But to have a General Assembly pass that kind of goal and law, and actually have the state agency, with the support of EPA on the Massachusetts side, you know, achieve that goal is a, is a, is a big deal. And now we're trying to measure exactly what the response is of the Bay, and of the ecology of the Bay to those actions. But it was a, it was a pretty, I, I don't know that that's been done anywhere actually so uh, but we need to do more as you'll see yes great jump at any time with that you know the perspective also you know I'd, I'd also just throw a long island sound has been very successful coming down in Connecticut not too much in New York uh, with the trading program for nitrogen down there with the so there are um, ways that we can reduce this so now I'm going to dwell in on the, the shaded part over there, which is the Taunton River estuary. This, this uh, graphic also shows the size of the, uh, the dots on there are relative to um, the historical, I mean, about you know, 12 years ago, uh, load of nitrogen. And you can see the various treatment plants um, you know, going up in the upper left to, uh, to Worcester and the upper right, Brockton, um, a couple of big in Providence and down in Fall River. So, um, Oh, it's been gone over to some statistics about the Taunton River watershed. Um, it's fascinating that the dam in the main stem, and it, it's uh, you know the impervious cover, which is going to obviously lead to stormwater as well. So this is um, this is kind of the uh, there's a lot a lot that goes into the two graphs that are on here. This first the circle graph shows you 
um, the low roots of nitrogen coming into the Tom River estuary by the different categories. The red category combines both the regulated stormwater and the non-point sources. So it's everything basically other than um, the sewage treatment plants um, in the red circle. So you can see that's, um, that's very high. It's not, you know, somebody was talking about Westport, where there's no point sources. Uh, you know, other places you'll see completely dominated by the, by the, uh, the non-point sources. So it, it is an excellent dominated stream, particularly up in the upper reaches of the tributary, uh, where it can be dominated by the effluent from the, the sewage treatment plants. <coughs> So the bar graph, hey, stop. <laughs> the, um, the bar graph on the other side um, then is looking, his, uh, starting with the tallest graph is the two colors show the, um, the upper part, the point sources and the lower part, the non-point sources. And then um, there's a red line drawn, which I'll talk about later, which is if you wanted to get to a part where we would estimate that you may be able to meet water quality standards in Mount Hope Bay, the Tonk River Estuary, which you'd have to do, and then um, a scenario whereby, by cutting down the point sources and the non-point sources, you'd get um, to that line. And in fact, that's kind of the basis is spelled out in the, in the permit, the fact sheets, the explanations of the permits on um, our basis for coming up with not only the line and the level that we thought would meet water quality standards, um, but also the allocation. Um, that shows that a 20% alloc uh, reduction in non-point sources, we figured that um, you know, and a greater reduction, yeah, obviously, that, that's shown up there in the point sources where you have the control at the uh, wastewater treatment plant. This also works out um, so that um, some of the larger sources are going down to about the limit that you could reduce it using the control technology, so it's three milligrams per liter. Um, this is kind of busy and you probably can't see it, but it's what it is is it's a list of um, the different towns in the uh, if the uh, public going treatment works in the Tonk River watershed, starting from the largest in Brockton and, and working your way down to the smallest. Um, as somebody mentioned earlier, this uh, Brockton and Tonkin are the largest in the uh, contributing into the Tonk River watershed. Um, and you can see that not, you know, we've calculated, this is a little bit of a summary of the calculations that we've done. Um, and you know, I'll take this out and explain a little bit of what we did. Um, we looked at the um, uh, effects of the nitrogen. Um, we looked at all the available data that we could in the Mount Hope Bay, the Tongue River Estuary, and, um, and Narragansett Bay. Um, there was a survey that was done um, by SMAST under the Massachusetts Natural Estuary Program. Uh, they went three years of monitoring data at a lot of different locations that gives a lot of continuous data. Unfortunately, about 10 years old, it was supplemented by some SON data of continuous to show what the dissolved oxygen was doing during the days, some break point data that we actually went and looked at dissolved oxygen, looked at that, looked at the effects, um, tried to judge where the transition was of meeting water quality standards in Narragansett Bay, and at that point saying, okay, what is in the long term average of nitrogen at that point? Okay, so that's, that became the target. And then working back from there, looking at what the different sources were for point choice and non source to come up with a allocation scheme which is outlined in the um, in the fact sheets for okay then this is what we have to do clearly we regulate not all the sources we regulate those point sources and with newt's uh, program regulate the, the municipal stormwater but there's a lot of other septic agriculture that, that needs to be done too and we're hoping that that you know kicks in so that we can get down to the, restoring the water quality in um mount hope bay okay what else is on this slide um, it gives you the um, uh, Brockton, for example, the draft permit was issued in February. Um, I'll repeat it at the end, but the public notice period on that draft permit is open and has been extended to May 4th. There's still a time to comment on that permit. Um, after that, we will uh, consider the comments for a final permit. The second one there is uh, Taunton, which we issued on April 10th, so net rate currently. Um, it's within 30 days um, where there could be an appeal on that. Um, from the ton. Um, it has in there, and you can see the other ones are in various stages. We're kind of working down, down um, in just briefly in Somerset and, and Fall River, where we've uh, worked with the Federal Food and Drug Administration to do dye tests there to kind of look at the circulation to get a better idea that it's not just straight the river and estuary, um, but to try to figure out what the best um, source for the, uh, the limits will be in those, those plants. And most of the other upstream plants, we have a draft or a final plan. So what were some of the um, challenges in, in doing the permits? Um, 
Uh, several uh, municipalities, notably Bro uh, Brockton, would like some flexibility in flow increases in effluent dominated streams. There are a lot of uh, development going on in a lot of um, other communities, and, and right now they take away from Abington and, and Whitman. Um, there's others that have expressed interest in that. Um, in, in regard to that, they expanded their plant and, and now have more capacity than uh, what their original design capacity is designed for a a plant that's um, 20 and a half million there as a design factor, um, and their draft permit limit is 18 million grams, a million gallons per day. Um, opportunities for infiltration and inflow. This is where all these sectors come together. We've got a stormwater, we've got drinking water for green infrastructure, um, uh, and then specifically to sewage, um, uh, Brompton has had a, a stellar success in eliminating infiltration and inflow. And what I mean by that is the pipe is underground um, and there's groundwater that get into it or uh, maybe a leader from a roof that goes directly into it. So you're basically treating clean water uh, and wasting that capacity to sewage treatment plant. Um, they've gone from over 20 million gallons a day, 20, 23 million gallons a day, maybe down to 14 million gallons a day by uh, an aggressive infiltration inflow program there. So that's, um, that's always there. Conservation is always a good uh, way to do so you um, use the capacity for sewage rather than for clean water. Um, in, in interpreting the narrative standards in each one of them for, for nitrogen and for phosphorus um, is a challenge, which I'll talk about a little bit more later, um, and um, the affordability. So i trying to keep moving along here. That's the outflow from the uh, Brockton uh, sewage treatment plant with the final aeration step. Um, one of the things to notice is it, to the far left you can see the stream. It does go into Salisbury Brook um, stream, Creek Brook, uh, Salisbury Plain Brook, um, which um, is, so it, it's at low flow conditions in the summer, 75%, 95% of the flow in that river is the treated effluent from the plant. Um, as, as a result, there are a number of impairments that have been documented by Watkins Consulting to others of impairments here related to the benthic organisms as well as uh, impaired for um, algae. So um, in the Brockton draft permit that's out there, probably the, the most contentious issues, one is um, the flow limit, which we put at the previous design flow limit of 18. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, the total nitrogen load, which is a mass-based limit, but it's based on a three milligrams per liter treatment at the design flow, um, and a phosphorus limit, which is uh, 0.1, which is based on the freshwater impairments in um, the upstream tributaries, tri tributary um, to the Taunton River. So let me go through um, just a slide or two on each one of those, and then I'll be done. So on the flow issue, um, in the flow limit, there was a request uh, to increase the flow limit from 18 to 20.94. Um, we looked at that, and we, and as, again, as I said, it's, uh, the discharge makes over 95% of the, the flow in the, the Salisbury Plain River in low flow conditions. It's effluent dominated down all the way to the main stem of the, the Taunton River. Um, we felt that it's impaired for um, aquatic bioassessments, for excess algae growth, ozone oxygen, phosphorus. We just thought that the stream was too little to assimilate more of the waste until we've shown that they were meeting our quality standards um, in that stream. Um, it's controversial. You know, there are other interests involved that other towns want to tie in um, to that, that treatment plant. Um, the procedure for that is uh, what's called an anti-degradation analysis, so that uh, we make sure that the existing uses of the river are not degraded, which involves looking at alternatives um, to that. Um, and uh, in the fact sheet, we present how that anti-degradation analysis could be done. Um, as I said now, Brockton has had an aggressive and successful II pro uh, program, so they're down below that 18 now. Um, and as we get into nuances, but they can use that capacity to tie into other towns or their, themselves that they have been able to kind of earn by cutting back the amount of flow. Nitrogen. Again, we uh, don't have the benefit of a number that we're trying to clean up to in, in rivers and streams, be somewhat site-specific, so it's a narrative standard, and it says 
Uh, all naturally occurring surface water shall be free from nutrients and concentrations that cause or contribute to an impairment or an existing, the, the, this existing or designated. So our job is to interpret that narrative standard in this particular context of what is uh, then meeting water quality standards in a, in a measurable way downstream in the Taunton River estuary in the case of nitrogen and in Mount Hope Bay uh, and then work that back up to, the, to an allocation and concentration scheme for the different wastewater treatment plants. Clearly, you know, you, you're, most of you or many of you are scientists, you know that when you're asked a question like, give me the one number that exactly represents this, there are lots of uncertainties, there's lots of different factors that go involved with it. Um, no, we did not look at every factor. You know, we heard a very interesting uh, presentation on the climate change in the Taunton River Basin. Um, no, I can't say that, you know, the amount of flooding from the water increase, we did not consider that. What we did is what's called a, um, a, re a reference-based approach, which is I described it, we went down to the, to, the, to the data that we had in the estuary, and we found where we thought the transition was between um, meeting water quality standards and dissolved oxygen was a big factor in that. There was no, we, we decided there was no, in the area of concern, established historical eel, eel grass, so that wasn't the effect we were looking for. Um, so in algae concentrations, and then tying that back. And then we, we did a, a salinity model to look at the salinity in the, in the ocean compared to upstream, where it was zero, and then to get a gradient on how much the contribution to that, at that point, was from the ocean compared to coming downstream from the river. Um, and then work back to an allocation. So that's my explanation. I think we, if Dave Pickham was here, he'd do even better, but he might, might take longer to do it. So no, he's very interesting. Um, so this is uh, the, the nitrogen. <laughs> I turned my page to not yours. Um, so, so the allocation came out that um, it was 0.3 milligrams per liter for some of the large discharges, five for some of the medium ones, um, and eight or uh, minimize some of the very smaller ones that were a, a small subset of the uh, um, loading. Um, and again, the allocation assumed 20% non -source point source to get to that. Okay, my last is on phosphorus. Uh, phosphorus is approached a little bit differently. It also has the same narrative standard. All surface water is free of nutrients and concentrations that cause or contribute to an impairment. Our job is to interpret that. What does that mean as far as what limit to put on the uh, given wastewater treatment plant? Um, the Salisbury Plain River is um, typical of your nutrient uh, algae um, dominated river. Um, in this case, we did use a reference, we used an effects base. Um, we looked at various different ecosystem criteria. There's one called the Global Criteria that links different levels of phosphorus in ambient streams or ponds or reservoirs for freely free flowing streams. Um, it uses a, a figure of 100 micrograms per liter of phosphorus. That's the value that we use. Then in any, any one of the permits, we would consider that and the amount of pollutions available in the river in low flow conditions to come up with the limit. In this case, um, the pollution was actually was basically zero. So they are at um, the gold book standard of 0.1 um, in, their, in their phosphorus concentration. You'll find in other rivers that you know, where it goes up, to, if there's more pollution, they may be able to get by with you know, a 0.2 or a higher standard. Last slide. So um, the, the permit also allowed for a five-year compliance schedule. I'm sure we have comments on that. Um, on the, the schedule for both the nitrogen and the phosphorus, we realize it can't be done. Sometimes we put schedules in different ways. I don't need to go into nuances of that. Um, and again, very importantly, you know, the, uh, we value very highly the public comment period process. Um, there are a number of permits when they come out in draft. You can't assume that it'll be in the final. The same way as the draft, we take them seriously. If, they, if there are significant changes that came out, uh, we will reissue it. That's uh, the story of the MS4 permit. It's, those have been following it for the years and years of waiting. You know that there was a North Coastal permit. We pulled that back. We've had new census and issued it again. You know, for public comment because there's enough significant changes. Um, so that's the case now. But you have until uh, if you want to weigh in, and you know we would encourage a diversity of different views. You have until May 4th on the um, the Brockton draft permit. It's a long. Um, the website, there's an ad for the website, we, it's got, uh, you want to look at the permit and the fact sheet, and that's, on that website you can see um, any one of the permits and draft 
and fact sheets and final permits that we've issued over the past five years or so. So again, thank you for your attention and uh, next day. Um, very quickly before I introduce Scott, um, I will say that so the, the nutrient, the, the permit limits that are being set by EPA in Massachusetts are being challenged. Um, there is a lot of political activity and the, the, the different municipalities are banding together to challenge the science. I will say this, the Upper Blackstone permit in Worcester attempted that um, very aggressively and they actually were appealing it through the courts, got it to U.S. District Court and tried to get it to the Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court, appeal the EPA's permit limits for Worcester. And um, they were not allowed to proceed any further and the courts deferred to EPA science. So there's a, a lesson to be learned. Um, I'm going to introduce Scott Horsley now, who has a um, some different ways of getting at some of these same issues. And uh, I just go about 15 minutes, Scott. So have at it. Okay. So my new approach to uh, business development and marketing is to show up late. People think you're a more important thing. <laughs> See if that works. Uh, my sincere apologies for walking in late. So um, I'm going to talk to you for about a project that I'm really excited about. I've been working on for the last two years with the Cape Cod Commission. And this is, of course, been on the run. Several of you have been involved in this. Beth Card's still here. She was back there a second ago. Um, a lot of you have been involved in this, so um, you may know something about it. This is this project really was in response to the Conservation Law Foundation's lawsuit. We've got Cape Cod moving uh, quickly, along with my EPA and DEP try to solve this nitrogen problem in the coastal waters on Cape Cod. So it's been a uh, better part of two years putting together what we're calling a 208, 208 Section 208 of the Clean Water Act, for those of you who remember that, in the 70s and 80s. Um, uh, the plan is intended to address this nitrogen problem. And as you can see, and most of you know, there are 15 towns, 57 watersheds, many of which cross town boundaries, which makes it, of course, a challenge. Um, so what we did is really cast the net very wide at looking at potential technology. Prior to the study, there was an estimate of about five to six billion dollars to sewer the Cape to solve the nitrogen problem. A lot of people felt that was too expensive, so we wanted to take a fresh look at it. And this is a quick graphic on many of the other technologies we looked at. Some of us call them green infrastructure, some of us call them non-traditional technologies. That's what they're called in the 208 plan, if you want to look at it, which is on the Cape Cod Commission's website. But it's a very broad group of technologies. Um, we like to think probably as broad as anywhere, because we started in places like the Chesapeake and Long Island Sound and all the other NEPs around the country to look at what has been done and, and get cast in that pretty wide. So, I'm just going the wrong way here. David warned me about this. We took um, basically two teams trying to solve the nitrogen problem. And I should mention that in many of the estuaries on Cape Cod, we have these MEP, Mass Estuary Program studies, that give us a target number. So we're fortunate that we have those. Um, we took, we basically formed two teams and tried to solve the problems using two different methods, a traditional approach using sewer, which I already mentioned, and then another group of crazy people, including myself, we said, let's try to solve this problem with virtually no sewers, or very limited sewers, and look at this long list. This is the so-called non-traditional approach. You'll see the uh, two technologies, the two approaches are shared by both teams, and those are fertilizer management and stormwater reduction. Um, David's group at EPA says there's this MS4 program coming, so we think the towns in the Cape are going to be doing a lot of stormwater management works. We want to take credit for that, and we negotiated with EPA to get a 25% initial removal credit for fertilizer management if the towns do a number of things, which I don't have time to get into right now. Uh, we also negotiated a 25% reduction in fertilizer credit if the towns adopt local bylaws and orders they have done. That's a good outreach, like Samantha's group here is down in the North South Rivers, and um, try to reduce the fertilizer loadings. And then beyond that, we looked at a whole bunch of these other technologies that I already mentioned. Now, in the Cape, about 80% of the controllable nitrogen is wastewater. Uh, the other 20% is roughly split between fertilizers and stormwater. And again, this is the controllable nitrogen because Really one of the largest sources is rainfall. And as a brief aside, we've had a study ongoing that's analyzing the trends in nitrogen and precipitation, which is suggesting significant declines in the past several decades, so that's kind of good news. We don't really consider that a controllable source. 
So what are the, just a quick look at some of these technologies. Um, lawn care, fertilizer management, vegetative buffers. I don't know plenty about that. Uh, rain gardens, stormwater management, already part of the program, I mentioned that. Just a little bit better picture of a rain garden, stormwater management, that maybe fit into some more of the suburban areas on the Cape. Um, <laughs> Again, the agency EPA has in the, in the draft permit, there's a whole section on pet waste management. So this is a, even though this is a funny slide, this is a serious problem, so this is part of the issue as well. Um, one of my favorites, I can go on for hours on this, urine diversion toilets. If 80% of the source of nitrogen in the cave, controllable source is sewage, and if you believe that 90% of the nitrogen in human wastewater is in the urine, then we should think about that. And some crazy Europeans and Australians and Chinese and now four homeowners in Falmouth have installed. <laughs> I, didn't see, I didn't say crazy there, I know some Falmouth people here. Have installed these systems. And the idea is if you can separate the urine and then do something creative with it. In Vermont, the Rich Earth Institute is putting it on hay fields to grow hay. In Germany, they're, they're making fertilizer that then can be applied to actually crops or other, other turf grass areas. I'm thinking about golf courses in this area, for example. Um, so a lot of potential here, but there's some big hurdles, some big social hurdles, et cetera, et cetera. And we talked a lot about that at the time. One of the other technologies that's gotten a lot of interest is permeable reactive barriers. Most simply put, take a trench, perpendicular groundwater flow, close to the shoreline, but not on the shoreline, um, and install something, some carbon-based media, wood chips. Um, there's a, there's a Depth, as you can see, maximum depth is actually a machine that will excavate four foot wide, 40 feet down, and not only scrape out the existing sediments and soil, but simultaneously put in wood chips. Pretty interesting piece of equipment. So it does exist, they do do this. And these trenches have been installed in probably hundreds of groundwater remediation projects around the country, usually not for nitrogen control, but the technology is there, it works. And so there is one of these installed down in McCoy Bay. Uh, they got 95% uh, plus removal rates on nitrogen, and there's a bunch of researchers up in Waterloo and other places that are replicating those removal rates. So this looks like a real viable technology. As the slide suggests, one of the challenges is here, the groundwater can flow underneath it. We can only get down 40 feet. And so our aquifer in Cape Cod is about 300 feet deep in many places. So we gotta think about that. And there's another solution. We can put it in wells and inject another carbon source, something like, uh, mineral oil, vegetable oil, and then we can go to really any depth that we can drill to. So this PRB technology is a very uh, interesting one. People are getting interested in it. Another one on the list is fertigation wells. Um, you know, the thing, I have to step back and say the problem we're talking about, nitrogen removal, nitrogen is a pollutant. Well, nitrogen is a fertilizer. We spend a lot of time buying it, applying it to grow food. So we, one of the principles here of the non-traditional green technology approach is to recapture what's already there and reuse it. So, Golf courses use fertilizers. Why not place the irrigation well with some thought given to recapture some of the nitrogen and apply that back on the golf course? Now, we worked, we've worked on the Pine Hills project here in Plymouth for how long now? 20 years? About, about that. And uh, we installed some fertigation wells there, we recaptured the groundwater downgrading the treatment plant, put it back on the, on the golf course, and I believe they actually cut back on some fertilizer use. It's based upon that. So the technology will work. Um, very low cost, and, um, and here's just a quick picture of that. There's the Pine Hills, that's the public supply well that Neil permitted. Uh, this is the wastewater treatment plant downgrading on the drink water supply. Oh, what a great idea that was, huh? And then a series of irrigation to recapture wells downgrading of the wastewater treatment plant. What I didn't tell you was groundwater, it flows left to right on this slide. I can probably infer it from those of you who know the Zone 2 technology and the shape of that thing. And recapture the, the groundwater downgraded in the plant that still has a lot of nitrogen in it and apply that to the golf course. So that was actually done here in Plymouth. Another option on the list, our list is uh, revegetating. Uh, Ivan Valiello, who's been one of the big researchers from Woods Hole, has been talking a lot about this. That really, our lost vegetation is really key to the fact that we have a big problem. So we can start putting it back in key places, that there could be some real benefits to that as well. Um, already showed you that slide. Uh, inlet openings, um, you know, the um, Massachusetts Division of Ecological Restoration has been very effective at going out and restoring a lot of um, habitat areas, salt marshes. Well, there's also an added benefit of water quality in many of these cases because we're increasing the flushing rate. 
So in several of the watersheds, these projects have been identified again as for dual benefits, not only habitat restoration, but also nitrogen mitigation. And then everybody's favorite, if we can solve our nitrogen problem by eating, by eating oysters, how much better can it get than that? And uh, as many of you may know, they've been doing this in the Chesapeake. Um, we've been experimenting with this. We've got probably five projects on the Cape now experimenting with this point. This, everything about this looks pretty darn good. It's real cheap, it provides jobs, and it removes a lot of nitrogen. And it removes it during the period of time, the period of the year, when the habitat issues in the water column are worst. So this is a pretty nice solution, and I think all 15 towns are moving forward at, uh, looking at this as one of the, one of the solutions. Um, so far, in our, I should mention, we prepared this thing called the Technology Matrix, which is the largest spreadsheet that I've ever seen in my life. And um, it has information on all these technologies. So for each one of these I'm going through, we have a quantified, estimated nitrogen removal rate, a cost, a range of performance, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so for this technology, the only thing we get in there right now is the amount of nitrogen in the, in the tissue of the shell, which is around 0.25 grams per animal. That's the only credit we're taking. But if you read the Chesapeake stuff, the real benefit comes from denitrification of the venting zone beneath them. And so we haven't taken any credit for that yet, but we think that there's an added benefit that we want to watch. And we're talking about doing a lot of monitoring on the cage to really try to nail this stuff down. There's the aquaculture called cages. So this is just to remind me to say these obviously can be restoration of actual beds where they can be in aquaculture. Another one that's being looked at pretty seriously is floating constructed wetlands. We don't have, as far as we know, we don't have any of these on the Cape, but everything I've talked about this is the only thing we don't have so far. We do have four installations on Martha's Vineyard, and we have hundreds of installations around the country, mostly in the freshwater, I might add. But, and this is just one design, which I won't get into due to time, but there's a whole bunch of potential commercial applications of flowing wetlands that appear to be pretty viable as well. Those are the Martha's Vineyard installations that are being studied right now. Okay, it's just wind up with a few slides here. So back to the two teams. We have two teams looking at each one of these 57 watersheds. One using traditional sewering approaches and another team looking at the non-traditional. This is the result of, for my home watershed, known as Three Bays, down in Katuit, you know that area, Osterville. Um, this is the watershed of the groundwater drainage area to that Three Bays system. And the shaded blue area is the sewer shed. So if you had to use sewering to solve the nitrogen, required nitrogen removal according to the MEP in this watershed, that would be the area where more than half would have to be sewered. Okay? If you apply fertilizer and stormwater management and take credit for that, the sewer, sewer, sewer shed shrinks. That's tough to say. It gets smaller because we're getting credits um, for nitrogen removal. Uh, and if we apply the non-traditional green infrastructure, it shrinks even more. In fact, it goes away. So according to our plan, this nitrogen reduction, which is 28,000 kilograms per year, is required reduction in this watershed. And it's my home watershed. Everybody should know how many kilograms of nitrogen you have in your home watershed, right? <laughs> this is the array of technologies that we do that. And so each one has an icon. There's, some fer there's four fertigation wells, and golf courses, there's some oysters, and Three of those five oyster projects in the Bay have already been installed since the MEP report has been done. Um, there is urine diversion demonstration project over at the Cape Cod Academy. There is PRBs, there is constructed wetlands, which I didn't mention, etc. And we have an accounting system, you know, which everybody has to show at least one slide that you can't see, right? <laughs> there it is. This is like a calculator sheet. What this does, it goes through each technology one by one, PRB number one, PRB number two, your diversion project, the Cape Cod Academy, et cetera, and it calculates the nitrogen reduction. And so we get to that 28,000, 27, 28,000 kilogram reduction number. Um, now some in real interesting, real current number from the town, information from the town of Orleans, who is also taking this information to the first town to implement the 208 plan. They have an engineering firm, traditional look at their own situation. They've come up with a plan. The purple area on the upper left is their proposed downtown sewering area. All the other stuff you see on the map is non-traditional green technology. So the, this is called the hybrid plan, which is what the commission is promoting. Do sewering in targeted downtown areas where it makes sense. Don't do it in more rural areas where it's too expensive and do other stuff, like 
computer infrastructure. But if you look at the numbers, they're very interesting. For the traditional technologies in Orleans, and that's the sewer, $98 million, that's 57% of the total cost, which is down the bottom, and that removes 32% of the nitrogen. If you look at the non-traditional te technology, $75 million, that's a combination of about five of those technologies I just went through. That's 43% of the cost, and it hits 68% of removal. So if you do some quick math in your head, what this is telling you is that according to the Orleans town engineers who took all the numbers from the 208 plant, reworked them, went out to vendors, double-checked all the numbers, changed them, etc. According to them, the green technology is about two to two and a half times less expensive than the traditional technology, according to this. And, that, and that's in a downtown, high-density, less expensive sewer area. Here's a quick graphic looking at the range. If we take all the technologies, or some of the ones I just went through, and put them on a graph in terms of dollars per kilogram removal, and then we look at the range of performance reported in the scientific literature, that's where the numbers fall out. Somewhere between, you know, the, the aquaculture is way down there, because again, this is revenue in one minute, got it. Um, between drill low up to maybe $300 per kilogram, and there's a number we got from Orleans, they're gonna pay about $1,000 per kilogram. So just again, a comparison of the technologies. Skip that due to time. And I think I'll end on this slide and suggest that um, there's been a lot of interest in this. However, there's also a lot of questions. Like, how do we know this stuff's gonna work? It's, it's variable, et cetera. And our answer is adaptive management. We've heard that term before. So the next step is to really put together and define exactly how that's gonna work. And generally what we're thinking is five-year increments. We install pilot projects test them, come back and meet and talk about adjustments. So if the PRBs work well, we'll do more. If they don't work so well, we'll do less PRBs and more oysters. And every five years make an adjustment going forward. And then having the sewering plan down at the bottom is kind of a backup plan. And that's, in a nutshell, that's the adaptive management plan. And I'll stop there. Stay around for a little bit. You, 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 I know you're gonna have some questions, um, but we have to keep moving, I guess. So. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that um, that actually ends this uh, session on wastewater. Um, we're gonna take a slightly shorter break. Uh, so we can come back here at four for recreational waters. All right. Thanks.